Please be seated. Sisters and brothers, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I knew something was wrong as I was reading the gospel because I thought, oh, I wish I had come up with a sermon on this. This is, this is a better reading. And then I realized it was the wrong reading, and I flipped to Sunday, August 14th through 20th, but the pages were sticky, and then I read next week's gospel reading. <laughs> So you heard last week's and you heard next week's, but you didn't hear this week's. Uh, thankfully, I, I made this mistake because I uh, was going to focus on the other text today. So anyway, I apologize. You'll hear next week's gospel again next week. It's a great one. I mean, it's a really fantastic gospel, so you got a little preview. But today I want to talk for just a moment about teachers. And I'm wondering if someone would be willing to tell me, tell us, who was your favorite, or is, your favorite teacher? Mrs. Webb. Who was it? Who? Mrs. Webb. Mrs. Webb. Okay, why was Mrs. Webb your favorite teacher? Uh, she was third grade, she was so welcoming, and she introduced so many new topics. She was welcoming, she introduced new topics in third grade. Mrs. Webb, we love you. All right. Anyone else? Favorite teacher? Yes, Bonnie. Mrs. Witcher, who was my fourth grade teacher and is still alive at 100 some years old, but she read aloud to us every day. She read novels, and it was amazing. Mrs. Witcher in fourth grade reading novels out loud every single day. Every day. That's probably why she's still alive now. <laughs> yes. Uh, Suzanne. Mr. Ferguson, for Mr. Ferguson for fourth and fifth grade. A Shakespeare play every year in fourth and fifth grade. That's amazing. One more. All right. Mrs. Morgan. Mrs. Morgan. What, what, what did, what, why was she your favorite? She encouraged you to try and that you could do everything if you set your mind to it. Amen. That's awesome. I have spent... A lot of my life in classrooms with many different teachers over many years. And good teachers are as varied as human beings, but they tend to have, in my experience, two traits in common. The first is that they genuinely love the subject that they are teaching. They care about it, they think it's important. And the second trait that good teachers tend to have in common is that they care enough about the student to want them to share that love. Because the subject that they teach has enriched their life, they want it to enrich the lives of their students as well. When I think back on the teachers I've had, and I've had many, many wonderful teachers at every level, from the very beginning of kindergarten all the way through my seminary education. When I think about the teachers that were the best, I don't necessarily remember the information that I downloaded from their class, although they were knowledgeable. But I remember the infectiousness, the contagiousness of their love for learning. And that is what has stayed with me. As a friend pointed out to me this week, it is noteworthy that of all of the titles by which Jesus is addressed in the Gospels, by far the most common is teacher. And that brings me to today's passage from the book of Proverbs about wisdom, which in the book of Proverbs, wisdom is depicted almost as a character in a story, as a female character or person who does things. And I want you to listen to the things that wisdom does, the verbs that are attributed to wisdom in this passage. Wisdom, the writer says, has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her animals. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. 
She has sent out her servant girls. She calls from the highest places in the town. You that are simple, turn in here. To those without sense, she says, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the way of insight. Wisdom builds. Wisdom cuts pillars. Wisdom butchers meat. Wisdom mixes wine, sets the table, sends people out on her behalf, and calls and speaks. Wisdom goes out looking for people to invite them to her feast. This is not what I would expect from a story about wisdom from the ancient world or from ours. I would expect in a story about wisdom, for wisdom to be a kind of reclusive character, someone who's hard to find, someone that you can only reach and discover through hard work and patience and maybe even suffering until you finally find it and then you get to enjoy the blessings and the treasures that wisdom has for you. But that's not, that's not what our story says. Our story says that wisdom goes out looking for people. Wisdom reaches out to the unwise, to the foolish, to those who are unlearned, and says to them, come to my house and be fed. Come and learn a better way. Come and be transformed. Wisdom loves the world that God made. In fact, if you read the previous chapter of Proverbs, which I recommend, it's wonderful, it's beautiful, If you read the previous chapter of Proverbs, wisdom made the world with God. Wisdom loves the world that God made. And wisdom cares enough about the student to try to share that love with them. This is maybe one reason that early Christians reading this passage saw Jesus in the character of wisdom. Oh, this is Jesus the one who seeks us, the one who does for us, invites us. And the second person in the Trinity, God the Son, was known and is known as the wisdom of God. But here's the thing. Just because wisdom seeks us out does not mean we are willing to be found. Does everybody know what I'm saying there? Okay. I just looking for some recognition, okay? Just because wisdom is looking for us does not mean that we are willing to be found. And just because wisdom invites us into her house does not mean that we are willing to show up. Amen? Okay. And just because just because wisdom means to help us does not mean that we are willing to be helped. Wisdom is saying in this passage, humanity, human beings, I am scattering $100 bills all over the sidewalk. And y'all just keep walking by them. Come into my house. Come and sit and learn from me and eat and drink what I have prepared for you. So as we begin a new school year, I want to spend this last moment here on the words of Paul the Apostle that I think get at this very real problem. The world and the wisdom that creates the world is this massive gift for us, and yet we struggle to accept it. So one of the things that Paul tells the church in Ephesus in the the reading that we get today is that he tells them, be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise people, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. Making the most of the time. I think if I could go back into my own education, to my own fourth and fifth and high school classrooms, if I could go back to my own childhood room, I would put this up as a motto. All right, I would write this in gold letters and put it up right on my door as I went out in the morning. Make the most of the time. And the word here for time doesn't really mean time like on a clock or a calendar. It means a moment. It means you could even say an opportunity. Because that is what we get 
when someone takes the time, when someone devotes their life to teaching us, to doing us some good, because they care about what they have to teach, and they care about the people who are there to learn. It is an opportunity. It is a moment that is there to be seized. Even when it's a subject, okay, that you might not like. Anybody here got some subjects in school that they do not like? <laughs> Even when it is a subject that you may not be good at or think you are good at. Anybody got any of those in their lives? Math? Yeah, that was me. Yeah, yeah, that kid knows, yeah. Yeah, it starts early, it starts early. Look, even when it's not your favorite thing, even when it's not your best thing, it is an opportunity. And when I think about the people who teach and care for our young people here, and when I think about the people who teach the children at my children's school, when I think about the people who guide and help form young adults as they go through their advanced education, I think about all of the love and all of the devotion that gets expressed in that moment, in that opportunity, that we can make a good use of. And when I think back at my own education, I don't remember any of the, the, the bad parts of it. I, I only think, I, I wish I could have learned more. And that is inherent in every human relationship. It's, it's there in every time that we meet someone who is there to do us some good and every chance that we have to do another some good in every encounter of Jesus around his altar and in his word. And it just so happened that I had occasion recently to remember one of my own favorite teachers as we were at the youth gathering in New Orleans. This is Young people from all over the country in our denomination. 16,000 of us in a basketball arena in New Orleans, and it just so happened that one night we were se seated in front of a church from Madison, Wisconsin, where I went to high school. And I said, oh, I went to high school. I went to Memorial High School in Madison. And a bunch of these kids said, oh, we go to Memorial. And I thought back to the one teacher that I thought would still be working, and... And I said, oh, uh, I'm going to change his name here because I don't want to embarrass him. I said, oh, do, 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 is Mr. Anderson still there? They said, oh, yeah, we love Mr. Anderson. He's great. And I remembered in that moment, and I told them the story about Mr. Anderson when he was much, much younger than I am now, <laughs> inviting, or uh, we actually kind of invited ourselves, some friends and I invited ourselves to go along with him to a trivia contest that he and some friends had done for years and years in northern Wisconsin. They broadcast the questions over the radio for 50 hours straight, and you come up with the best answers, and you call them in. And this is in the days before internet search, OK? So this is hard. And, uh, and we said, oh, can we come along? And he said, OK, yeah, sure. Um, this could never happen today, but it was great. <laughs> and we went up. And the last year that I was in high school, I flew back to Wisconsin in January from a college interview, and it was a snowstorm, and Mr. Anderson drove up to the Milwaukee airport in a van with a bunch of my friends and picked me up and drove us all up to northern Wisconsin to do this trivia contest because, because he cared about us. He cared about the opportunity we would have to spend time together, but also to learn to be challenged, to encounter knowledge in new ways. That is the blessing that is available to us in the moment when we find someone who cares about the world's knowledge and about the world's wisdom and who cares about our own willingness to receive it. That is the blessing that can come through these moments, through these opportunities that can change not just us, but the world around us as well when we say yes. Amen.